called Gabrielle Denunzio. Denunzio was famous for being Denunzio. He was once described by the mayor of Pescara as the author with blue eyes and no means. As a kid, he spent long hours by his window lost in reverie. He was terrified of empty houses and soft summer breezes. When he stood with his head bent low, it was said an escapade was forgotten. But he always found time to walk and talk to his dogs nearing twilight, nibbling his hand, turning in a fandango of love and leaping. Mercedes de Acosta, well, she was a Spanish journalist in the uh, turn of the last century up through the 1930s, 40s. She knew just about everyone and loved almost everyone, including Stravinsky, and was greatly misunderstood. She relived her life not from notes but from memory. Take Fitzgerald, for instance, hurling himself headlong down a whole flight of stairs, then to conclude everything had been going too calmly that day and felt he needed a little excitement. Always the rides into the Hollywood Hills or in the Midi in the past catching up. Always the right place at the right time, even with the phone ringing, the wind blowing off the corset in the gloom. They say she introduced slacks to Hollywood. They say she loved cats. They say her timing was impeccable. This next poem is for uh, an American journalist named Josephine Herbst. She, she went under the nickname of Josie, which is what this poem is called. She'd be sifting through the rubble and muddle of sometimes sleeping. Dreaming, she stood at the mouth of a tunnel, a stargazer recording a quarter moon crack up, a jungle oasis, the pockets of smoldered debris. Or was it simply years later recounting the Florida Hemingway in downtown Madrid saying, Oh, Josie, you should have never thrown that king back into the sea. Well, why not? Always one of the boys. Always the sea and the salt and the lines cast out like a feather. Always the comings and goings, the bustle and hustle, the years in between. Explosions heard off in the distance, dead cigarettes singing. Lulu de la Falez, 1947-2011. Lulu was once the muse to end all muses. She had a resistance reflecting. Headstrong was she when it came to climbing the ramparts or walking the land of some far-flung neighbor's estate. Those drafty chills when the ewes were shorn of their coats and the sun kissed the mountain's edge one last time and all the light backlit held that moment in silence, the forest creatures bowing their heads. And then the gloom settled in slowly, settled in slowly, settled in slowly. Joseph Langland, poet, 1917-2007. Far from the last glimmers of late autumn light, far from the darkening wood, from the windswept reaches, from the dog days of August, from the shadows of leaves overhead, from the gossamer shadows, children's voices commingling, train whistle distant, the last light fading on the hands quilting, the hide and seek shadows far from the green pastures, the lilies of the valley, the thickets, the barn cats, the rainbows, the curtains, the long winding road just before sunset, far from the winds of heaven. Howard Hansen, Symphony No. 2, Opus 30, Romantic. The Allegro con Brio could have been any number of things. It could have been the chattering twilight of the train whistle distant. Could have been a swift silhouette of poplars and maples racing against the red-orange glow, against the day's waning, and open fields furling and furling, the flickers of darks and of lights of clouds swirling. It could have been life goes on or as life ending, the echoes descending, 
the gossamer light and the cat napping, the empty rooms, a half-open book, the scattering rain, not the rain even, against the denouement, the slowness, the fading. Alphonse de Lamartine returns to the family house after more than two, after more than two decades. Gone are the sounds of the passing landows, the barn cats, the cypress of the gently swaying at noon, the open French windows, the gossamer branches, the sky never more blue. So too the dog days, with even the faintest of flickers, the fillies making their way to the barn as twilight descended, those clear and mild evenings, the drawing room filled with the chatter of friends, the quick bedtime embrace, the kiss on the forehead, the feel of the tall grass caught by a breeze and seclusion, those nights alone in the kitchen, those long ago rides with the water. Theodora Stamos, 1922-1997. He would be 90 today that he outlived the taint that was gaining on him, whether crossing the Bowery or shuttling along in the L, for all those lost years, for all those canvases roped in the closet, the grit and the cigarette ash, the hands calloused and smudged, for all the good times and bad times rolled into one, till those last names slipped through the cracks, the paint splattered floor, the dust and the mold, the hallway grimy and dark, the stairwell askew, the light, sunlight pouring through those wired up windows, the sky a deep azure, a faraway welcoming hue. Good day to you, Mr. Stamos. How are you today, Mr. Stamos? Photographing Albert Cosri. He'd gotten dressed up a French dry clean suit and tie just for the sunlight. Pocket square tucked in as a flourish. Yet he seemed quite out of sorts with the back alleys of Paris, the cul de sacs with no names that at times seemed unforgiving. He seemed more and more to withdraw until 1.30 or so, that for him was the day dawning, sunlight past the glare of high noon. Shop windows reflecting not so much revealed as surreal. And then suddenly one day the words came tumbling out, undeciphered and winded. He'd lost his voice and everything thus uttered was an ugh, ugh, pointing to his neck. A close glance, a big chunk gouged away, ravaged by years of gitans at the floor nightly, his head balanced as if on a thimble. Violet, the red-tailed hawk. Blessed is the bird from conception, for they carry the voice and have wings. The sway and the turn and the courtship, something cat-like. Blessed are they who see the nets from afar and who flee to their mountains in the fading light, for they are the birds of the air, for they descend from the heavens and ascend to the heavens. They are God's eyes. They are aware. And they are the masters. Valerie Elliott. It's 3.15, you're late. Ushering me into the dark hallway of a flat. I can't remember where. It's years now, we sat her mom beside her as we rocked on Sherry Strait and told me tales and showed me Ansco colored snaps of Tom vacationing Bermuda, sallow like the sand surrounding him and smiling awkwardly. <clears throat> Who knows what that smile revealed, not looking back beyond decline, years from when they met. A long line of hopefuls in the chill. The interview at Faber for that job would take her far and far beyond those years, and all for that one fate broken on. The plaster cast won him over nonetheless, revealing no less of truth professed when she became keeper of the flame. Tom's books in the next room, consumed by the same embers, listened in. The chilly air, the drafty street, it's getting late. The, uh, every time I see a movie with Robert Donut, Donut I always, I'm reminded of, of uh, 
the room locks he would refer to his uncle, uh, the architect Charles Voice, he would refer to his uncle Charlie or Uncle Charles. I always found that to be quite endearing. Uh, Charles Voice was the father of English vernacular architecture and a progenitor of the uh, arts and crafts movement. I thought it would be appropriate to read this poem, this gallery called Architecture for Art. And Voice was uh, an architect that my friend Jedi here introduced me to, so it would be appropriate that I would read this. It's called Voicey. Even his name is hard to pronounce and no one remembers. In nearly all of his houses, one has the curious feeling of being swept up in the 1890s, which makes them all the more modern when one realizes that's when they were built. And yet one doesn't get the sense there's even a telephone handy, much less a light switch. So what we are seeing are minute details such as the brass door knocker, the angled overhang, the perched sconces perfectly balanced, the window frames perfectly balanced, and so on. The chimneys like bric-a-brac sentries loom in the long twilight. What else? Consequently, his greatest success may have been the houses he built for Herbert George Wells and for Matthew and the publisher plotted on a rise, angled, and set back discreetly. Not the outward appearance, per se, the rough wall, the non-functional, the surface of things, but what's not at first noticeable, wainscotings everywhere, and then you look elsewhere. The driveway graveled and covered in snow, for example. The spruce rustling out back. A sort of radiant idleness in the way the drawing room opens up. And the cushioned window seat is likely where you'll first sit in the late afternoon when the outdoor light is seen dropping off. And there's a book in your lap, a lighthearted novel of sorts. The patchwork of clouds always seems to set off a kind of high contrast. So the portions of sky that show through always appear painted in, not by numbers, mind you, but a clear indication, a chill in the air that time of year, August, or is it early November? And said no one really involved in the landscape ever sees the landscape. Perched high on a cliff, you get to see out, but never in. And that's where the magic comes in. And the clickety clack of typewriter keys fading off in the distance, the tea kettle thrumming, the sheltered, effortless life such atmospherics portray. Bygone times merely renovated, certain details added at the owner's request or a bed t bedroom moved down the hall to the left. Nothing ever happens, really. Nothing ever goes away, really. In no sense does his quietude spring directly out of his work, but merely suggests a more detailed array of elevations, floor plans from every which way. And then he walks away down the footpath. He'll take the train, most likely, or drive back to the city alone. There's a cozy fire, and in the study, outside, the wind is whistling. Thank you.